Williams, are you ready? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the briefing session for the Utah Board of Oil, Gas, and Mining on April 25th, 2018. We welcome all of those that have come so far to be here today. And uh, we look forward to your presentations. Our plan is to turn the rest of the presentations over to the division and Holly Brown, and we'll do that at this time. Welcome. Perfect, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Gill and members of the board. Um, as you know, today we are here to listen to the eight presentations of the nominees for the Environmental Excellence Awards. Um, before we begin, I just want to say that once, so today we're gonna have the presentations, we're going to have a working lunch, and then we are going to determine who the actual recipients of the awards will be. And then on Tuesday, May 22nd, from 4 to 6 p.m., we're going to have an open house and also the awards presentation here in this building. So we will be sending out um, invitations to that, but we figure we better determine who the award winners are first before we, before we do that. So, um, And then with that, we'll just move ahead into the presentations. And this morning, we will start off with um, Care McGee Oil and Gas Onshore LP, which is a subsidiary of Anadarko Petroleum Corporation. Um, the presentation will be given by Grizz Olin and Roger Knight. Um, and their project is being nominated. Um, this project highlights oil and gas spill prevention, mitigation, and response efforts. So with that, I will invite Grizz and Roger to come and give their presentation. Morning. I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity here. Just one. Uh, we record all of these for the for, are required to do that. So if you'd almost touch the microphone when you're speaking, that would be appreciated. Is that a little better? A lot better. And I, uh, my job is to make sure. I don't have many jobs around here, but one of them is to make sure the recording works. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present today. Our presentation is on uh, spill mitigation and prevention efforts. Um, our field uh, it is in the Greater Natural Buttes out, uh, south of Vernal, Utah, and we um, have uh, roughly 2,800 working uh, gas wells out there and producing uh, condensate and natural gas and a lot of water as well. And so a lot, a lot of our daily activities is to uh, control water flow, make sure that we're keeping it in the tanks, that type of thing. And um, it's always an ongoing battle as far as that goes. And some of our strategies we have there, we have spill prevention, that's design enhancements, inspections, different things to make sure tanks and berms and things are in inadequate uh, working order. Also spill mitigation, uh, surveillance and control enhancements, that's more, uh, we'll get into that a little deeper here in a minute, but that's more of like, uh, watching things with uh, tank trends, things like that as well. And also spill response training, boom deployment, um, things like that. We've made some substantial improvements uh, over the last couple years, as you can see, um, from 78% of fluid that uh, was released that made it outside of secondary containment to this year we're trending at 98%, keeping it inside secondary containment. And what that's due to is due to our um, several different things. Uh, one, tank level sensors. Uh, basically our tank level sensors are the sensors there that are in, that we install inside our tanks and we have an ILC, an integrated operative command center that watches these uh, tank trends uh, as it goes on uh, and they watch those, it's 24 hour surveillance on it so that we can, uh, if we have a drop in tank trends that we can catch that and we can get to people on location fast enough so we can catch a spill before it becomes a major event and then, and that's part of our goal is to keep things very minimal. Another big one is line metal tank berms. We have, tank berms are a best management practice but we don't have to have necessarily lined metal tank berms. Underneath the SPCC uh, with EPA and that where it's supposed to just be impervious to contain fluids and 
what we install in there is a 30 mil liner. It's actually a 20 mil liner, excuse me, 20 mil liner underneath our tanks. And then we come in, put the gravel, plus we have the dirt berm. What we found, how that really helps us out is, is we don't have, in our field, we have, we operate on um, the Union Indian tribe as well. And there's a lot of uh, wild horses and cows in there and they walk over our berms and knock those berms down. And sometimes we'll get berms eroded away to hardly anything on that if there's a dirt berm. But also a water truck driver may back into it, knock into it, knock your berm into half. But these metal tank berms, they're there. Um, they hold, they last, and with that liner underneath there, we, when we go off of our tank trends and we find how much fluid we have uh, released from one of the tanks, we generally recover all that fluid from the berm as well too. So that's another added benefit, that the integrity of that liner as well. Some other things that we have done as well is upgrade our piping from uh, carbon steel to stainless steel. Our water is very corrosive. Um, and with that, we have went to stainless steel and it's added immensely to it to get more life of our, our piping and whatnot. Another one is fiberglass liner installation where we basically go inside of our tanks and we install a fiberglass liner on the inside of the tanks. And that's just a whole nother protection level from the tanks f so they don't corrode out and then we can get more life of the tank. But it's also to um, keep the fluid inside the tank. Another thing that we are working on now is anode installation where we're installing sacrificial anode anodes in our tanks. Um, we're seeing some corrosion issues in our tanks, um, some, some short life in a few tanks, and this anode will get us a few more years and allow us to, that'll be the sacrifice versus the tank wall within coordination with our tank level sensors, the berms, all that. That's one of the big things that's helped us be able to keep fluids from getting on the ground and helping protect the environment. Another uh, big part of that uh, tank testing program is our ultrasonic tank testing. What we basically did is we went out and we measured the thickness of our tanks. And you can see on the right here, the, uh, this tank is down to uh, 2.7 mils. And that's towards the bottom of the tank. And that's where the tank has eroded away. And you can see how much wall thickness we've lost versus a new one on the left there. And we can go out and we have a spot on the tank where we measure that and we compare it year to year and look at it over time. And that way we know for sure whether we're getting too much tank loss or that. And when we find a tank that's uh, tank loss that's down into this 2.7 mil, we'll get rid of the tank and get it out of there before it becomes a spill. And that's the real goal of this tank integrity. We can also look at that and using different um, uh, equations, we can figure out what the life of the tank should be so that we know, hey, in, in three years, this tank possibly could fail, that type of deal. So those are some of the, one of the, another thing that we've installed. Automation is another big one where we basically, uh, like I mentioned before, our ILC, our Integrative Operations Center, and it's basically a, a room with the usually a couple people in that room 24 seven and their job is to monitor tank levels at different various locations and watch that and run those uh, numbers. And with the different algorithms we have, if the tank level drops to a certain, uh, certain amount, the, uh, it'll uh, trigger an alarm. We can get an operator there to location very quickly, dispatch a water truck either way, catch it real fast. And that's the goal behind that as well. Again, there's another, uh, example of our tank metal tank berms. Another thing that we um, worked on this last year is at our Chapita gas plant, we have installed, we have three, uh, ten, they're 11,000 barrel tanks. And um, on that drainage, we thought, got together and we thought, you know what, if we put some head gates on this drainage, because we operate right next to the White River, where you know that there are the four endangered fish species in the river. And we thought, you know what, we could probably catch anything that might come down this drainage before it even came close to the White River, if we put a couple head gates in just two places. And so we installed a couple head gates, and that allows us to be able to run in there, shut that head gate, and catch a spill before it even was to come close to the White River. Another thing that we've implied, uh, worked on is a boom deployment team. We basically trained up our people with a 16 hour inland marine oil spill training course where we learned uh, how to create overflow dams as you can see on the picture on the left where if we're in a dry wash, one of your greatest assets might just be a tractor, a, a dozer or something like that to be able to stop a spill or anything from getting any further. But you can create an overflow dam to allow the water to go through but catch oil before it goes through the, uh, the dam there. But we also have our boom deployment trailers with 13,000 feet of, or 1,300 feet of boom 
and support for that as well with some skimmers, uh, different things so we can deploy on the White River within, our team's usually out there and those trailers are in the field. We can get boom deployed and be on the river within an hour, hour and a half, that type of deal. So do you have any questions? Um, what kind of volume of water do you handle on a daily basis, produced water? It is oh, roughly, um, I think it's around, daily I wanna say it's around 20 million barrels. Barrels or gallons? Barrels. Okay, barrels. 20 million I barrels believe, per day? That's right. I could be wrong on that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll hold that question. But what, what kind of salinities is that water average? It varies. It varies from um, 8,000 to, mostly it's our chlorides are the real high ones that we get in our waters. We get anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 parts per million on our chlorides, and that's what really causes, drives our corrosion, where it comes from the, where it comes down uh, from the formations we're coming out of, and the salinity end of it, it's pretty high as well, too, in that uh, 8 to 10, I can't remember exactly where it is off the top of my head, but. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. This next presentation is for a project um, done for Crescent Point Energy Corporation, uh, but however, they were nominated, and the presentation will be by K&H Reclamation Sione Kafusi. And this project is located near Ure in Uinta County and is for outstanding final reclamation of an oil and gas site. You don't have any relatives that are football players, do you? A couple. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to help you click through it? Or? Yeah. Okay, I can do that. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Gill and board members for the opportunity to be here. Um, like Holly mentioned, uh, my name is Sione Kafusi. I own and operate um, k &H Reclamation in the Uinta Basin. Um, I do reclamation work um, kind of across the board. This topic came up and Crescent Point's have been a company that I do a, a lot of majority work for and I just thought they would be an awesome company to nominate so this is my first time doing something like this so that's kind of why I'm here. Um, Crescent Point is, is, a, is committed to conducting our business in a manner that minimizes the impact on the air, land, water surrounding our, our operations. We continue we really look to implement practices and technologies that enhance our environmental performance. Since the inception of our company, we have contributed $2 million to a fund dedicated to environmental restoration, ongoing emissions reduction, and end of life abandonment. Th that's kind of off of their website. Um, from what I do personally, I've been able to see that firsthand. Um, I'm also, my dad's Tongan um, and my mom's Native American, so, so I'm a member of the Ute Indian tribe there um, in the Uinta Basin. So being able to see firsthand that how much they really care for our land and how much they try to put back into things um, has been really interesting and very um, rewarding to see um, from a company because I don't see a lot of that. So it was really good when they came in and I seen the standards that they set across the board. Um, with our projects with them, we, we kind of have each project is analyzed. Um, by a specialist that I have that works for me, he that looks at soil, plant, water impacts um, are considered in the de development of a compressive, comprehensive well life rec reclamation plan. Um, many of the projects that we work on there are in a really harsh environment. It's hard to grow stuff in the desert. Um, so the, we, we've looked at a few different ways of doing it and they, they've been very resourceful in, in helping us to be able to find those different things and different techniques of what actually is gonna work. So that's been great of them. Um, 
when we do analyze it, we we come back with an exact seed mix of what the what's recommended for that site uh, through soil tests, plant vegetation, and water availability. Um, a detailed reclamation plan is developed for each site. Um, we kind of the majority of the work that I do with Crescent Point is on the, their tribal locations, so I, we kind of work hand in hand with them um, and the Ute tribe to develop this these plans for each site. Um, this is just kind of a site analysis of this specific location. The location we were talking about um, was 2913 D3E. It was a, just a regular PNA where um, we they did a plug and abandon. Uh, the well was completely done. Uh, we came back in and reclamated the whole location back to uh, its natural status. Photos are taken before and after. Um, the reclamation site is mapped using a GIS technology. If any location has additional challenges such as high erosion potential or low so soil fertility, Crescent Point provides the resources for extra protection. Organic compost is used on many reclamation projects or barbed wire fencing to restrict animal traffic. Uh, like the previous gentleman was stating that there's a lot of wildlife there that kind of comes back onto these sites. So what we've done in, with Crescent Point is they've allowed us to go in and, and build fences around the area that on the final wells when we um, do the reclamation project to be able to protect it for the first couple of years to help the vegetation grow and reestablish. This was just a kind of a map of the area that we, of the location that we did. Uh, we go out and map it for them and then we turn this into them. This was a seed mix that we used on this specific location. Uh, just kind of pictures of beforehand. Um, on the next slide, you can kind of see the fence that we've, we've put around the whole exterior of the location. When we did this nomination, we, we I didn't really kind of do it specifically just for one site. It was kind of a bunch of different projects and things that we had seen through uh, through working for them. This was a big pipeline project that we had did working for them. Um, there was some tough areas, um, really environmental sensitive areas that were close to rivers. Um, they kind of went above and beyond as far as allowing us to, to design a plan to make sure that it protected everything there. Uh, like I said previously, they just have been an awesome company, especially in different things to, to help us have the resources with, that actually do the work in the field to make sure that the environment is safe um, and that they're able to revegetate the areas that they've worked in. A project that they've been doing this last year, and I don't know the exact terminology, we just call it teardrop, um, is Crescent Point has recently implemented an initiative to reduce the footprint on existing well locations. Uh, many locations are being changed from a rectangular pad to a teardrop shape where the corners are reclaimed and excluded from vehicle traffic at active sites. Uh, you can see this location where the, we've went in and reclaimed this corner of the, of the pad. Um, it's an existing well that they'll continue to produce, but they, when the pad was built, there was no need after it was built to have that access there. So we went in and reclaimed those corners um, and they're going to continue to do this from what they've told me um, on more wells where they're going to try to start slowly taking everything back to its natural state. Uh, that was pretty much it, what I had for my presentation today. Are there any more questions or anything I can answer for you folks? Board member, questions? Could you just show us that last slide that was really quick? Oh, sorry about that. And I, and I did um, print out a copy of this for you guys, and you guys should have it up there, Mr. Brown. Just for uh, us, from your view, what is above and beyond what you're required to do by regulation in your presentation? I, I don't know the, um, the actual laws and stuff of what they're supposed to do, but from the boots on the ground of actually doing the work, it's a lot more than I do in other fields, but I don't want to bad talk any other fields that I work in. But I do a lot more for Crescent Point than I do in other fields. 
Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Our next presentation is by Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline and will be presented by Jacob Abraham. Uh, this nomination is for the Natural Gas Storage Integrity Management Program in both Daggett and Summit Counties. Thank you, Chairman, Board, honored guests. Today I'm very excited to come and represent Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline in our initiative um, to demonstrate continual environmental stewardship through storage integrity management. Today I'd like to give a brief outline of who is Dominion Energy or the legacy Questar Corporation, where our facilities are exactly located, talk about environmental stewardship and storage operations, and specifically discuss the key elements of our program which allows us to be successful, which is a field integrity plan and a well integrity plan. Last, the importance of environmental stewardship in the context of regulatory collaboration. Dominion Energy as a uh, company is an integrated energy company. This means that we have both electric and natural gas resources and we are one of the largest regulated uh, utility companies in the United States. Specifically speaking, we have businesses in the electric generation. Um, most of our investment recently has been going into uh, adding natural gas um, power generation from coal, as well as a wide portfolio of uh, wind and solar. Specifically in the state of Utah, we operate 500 megawatts of solar power as well. In addition, we operate three large uh, storage facilities in the state of Utah, uh, which are denoted here on the map with the red star. These are located in Summit, two of them are located just outside the town of Colville, Utah, Summit County. And our large flagship facility is located in Daggett County, and it's called Clay Basin. It's right by Flaming Gorge. Collectively, these facilities store 125 billion cubic feet of total gas. 55 of which is used for the uh, utilization um, by the local distribution company and other uh, industrial customers. A little bit about Dominion Energy West. We operate a completely integrated natural gas company. We have development and production through our Wexpro company. Uh, we are representing today Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline, transmission and storage pipelines. And we also have our retail uh, business, which is now called Dominion Energy Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. What we're really excited to talk to you all about today is the concept of environmental stewardship through storage operations. And first and foremost, Dominion Energy is fully committed to meeting its customers' energy needs in an environmentally responsible and proactive manner. By so doing, Dominion Energy is also one of the largest underground gas storage operators in the country and has extensive technical expertise and experience. Primarily, Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline focuses on proactive operating and preventative measures that assesses and lowers the risk of its storage facilities with a directive to minimize impacts to the environment and to the local communities in which we serve. What's interesting is Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline has actually been engaged for many years in underground gas storage uh, integrity management and is continually assessing its facilities for functional mechanical integrity and is always looking for ways to improve. One of these examples is we continually and routinely benchmark and share technical and environmental best practices with the remaining Dominion Energy Gas Storage uh, Corporation. One of these best practices have led to the instigation of uh, installment of additional containment around our wellheads and under key equipment during our storage workovers, as denoted in the photos. So what is uh, the, all this talk about underground gas storage? I'd like to just prevent a timeline of, of recent events. In 2015, one of our colleagues, the state of Utah, moved to uh, California, started working for the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources, Al Walker. 
Shortly thereafter, there was a large uh, incident at the Aliso Canyon Storage Facility, October 2015. During this time, Al did give me a call and I was sitting on a workover rig itself, uh, already going and perform performing the operating and preventative mitigation measures um, that would have prevented or, or at least identified the Aliso Canyon incident. What happened as a, as a result of this led to a federal mandate through the Safe Pipe Acts through Congress that regulated underground natural gas storage. Um, that went into effect with an interim final rule in uh, December 2016 and is currently in enforcement as of January of 2018. What I'd like to draw your attention to, however, is the fact that Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline had already had a, a long history of running legacy inspections in the 1990s and 2000s, and we retooled the program formally into a new storage integrity program starting in 2012, much before any government regulations or minimum requirements were established. We did this with the primary focus to ensure that we could continue to provide essential energy while keeping uh, the environment and local communities uh, protected. Briefly, our program um, focuses on a field integrity plan and a well integrity plan. I like to say this as kind of a macro view. Where is my uh, gas inventory? Is the proper gas in place or pressures associated with the volumes that I said that I am injecting or withdrawing? Uh, and then the second piece is the well integrity plan, specifically focused on the well side of, the, of our business, where we are performing uh, well workovers, doing casing and tubing inspections, we're continually monitoring our pressures, and doing uh, mechanical integrity tests. We do two tests for inventory, meaning complete shut-ins of our, our flagship clay basin facility twice a year to verify inventory and we do a very detailed aquifer inventory study uh, once a year. But where I really wanna focus today is on the well integrity plan. Initiative we did uh, well before 2015 is install real-time tracking of our casing and tubing pressures uh, with telemetry. That means for all of our current injection withdrawal or active wells, um, as well as key observation wells, we can track that in real time. We currently have a project to create pressure monitoring differential alarms to enhance uh, this. In addition, we're also tracking all of their pressures regularly as part of normal operations. The key takeaway here is the cross communication between casing tubing is evaluated and future workovers are prioritized accordingly. We operate uh, 60 storage wells in the state of Utah since 2012. We have worked over 19 of them. Our target is to get to six to eight in Utah per year. A workover is not necessarily throwing a tool down, the, down, down our well bore and checking for mechanical integrity. Our program is focused on retiring old tubing and ancillary equipment that might have aged. Uh, we go in and do a very detailed casing surveillance logging program, which means we're checking for the remaining wall thickness. Uh, we're running a gamma ray neutron logs to see if we've had any gas migration and temperature logs. We wanna be sure that in the instance the tubing does have some type of failure, that the casing can f serve as secondary containment such that we will be able to get to it quickly and resolve it. Last, we're installing a premium or gas grade tubing in the form of CS Hydro as well as installing safety valves where applicable. In addition to, to going and doing full workovers, uh, which is quite um, involved, we also do tubing inspections, in which case we're throwing in uh, magnetic flux leakage tools and similar tools that I just discussed um, in, in remaining wells to check the tubing integrity, make sure that these wells after 30, 40, 50 years of service are still fit for service else we prioritize replacements. Last thing to note, uh, in 2016, there was a, a large conference held um, and sponsored by the Department of Energy where there was a large discussion about safety valves. Um, safety valves is something that Questar Pipeline feels very um, strongly about in, in order to have very strong, robust design. We, we install automated either master valves or wing valves that allows us to, to uh, remotely shut in facilities if there is any concern, thus limiting the potential release of gases. We have this in over 95% of our storage wells. In addition, we've been actively installing or replacing subsurface safety valves, similar to what you would see offshore, 
in order to prevent if there's any damage to the wellhead specifically, the gas will be completely isolated and shut in uh, at surface. Uh, we currently have 17 of those to date. We have three more proposed. Kind of in closing, doing physical programs like storage integrity management is very uh, key to our success. However, another key is having good design to start out with. Our well design um, utilizes a casing tubing packer design, which has currently been deployed in California for gas storage. And we do have cement that provides zonal isolation uh, in our annuluses. However, we rely strictly on the two strings of steel, the tubing and the casing, as primary and secondary containment. We do have a couple wells where we do not have this isolation. We have plans to get them worked on and scheduled to have this configuration. And with the continual monitoring that we're able to do with our SCADA system, this will alert us in real time if we have an issue. Last, we've also instigated for a number of years an annual leak survey with physical gas detection around our wellheads to see if we have any potential uh, point sources of natural gas from our storage operation, as well as an annual valve maintenance programs well before any regulations um, from the federal or state levels were established. And this is an example of one of the wells we worked on there in the, in the Colville, Utah storage pool. Just in closing, Dominion Energy is again fully committed to meeting its customers' energy needs in an environmentally responsible and proactive manner. Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline voluntarily began its integrity program many years before any regulations and it's focused on protecting the environment from unplanned releases. And DEQP continues to value its continued partnership with the Utah Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, the Bureau of Land Management, and the Department of Transportation to ensure safe and reliable operations of underground gas storage in the state of Utah while minimizing impacts to the environment. Are there any questions? Board members, any questions? Davis. I can see that you started this program in 2012, well before these regulations. Are you still ahead of regulations, or are, th are the things you're doing now meeting regulations? That is a great question. Shortly after the regulations were announced, we as a corporation formed a, uh, a global storage integrity management plan that's being deployed currently in the states of Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, New York, uh, as well as the state of Utah and Wyoming. Our plan is to continue to stay ahead of the regulations, however. For example, our, con our uh, annular pressure monitoring program is not regulated or mandated at the, uh, through telemetry. We feel that's a very important part of doing um, good operations, as well as a number of the environmental um, or inspections that we've talked about. So we continue to want to actively participate in, in the conversation, but we want to also lead that conversation to ensure that we can have safe gas storage operations throughout the entire country. Other questions? Thank you very much. The next presentation is from Canyon Fuel Company, the Dugout Canyon Mine. Uh, the presentation will be given by David Spillman, and his pro the Dugout Canyon Mine's project is for outstanding results following applications of innovative environmental technology and environmental improvement to an active mine site. Good morning. I, I appreciate this opportunity to present to the board. A uh, little bit of background on the Dugout Canyon Mine. Uh, we're located approximately 13 miles northeast of Wellington, Utah in the Book Cliff Coal Field. Uh, we've been in operation for almost 20 years now. Uh, actually, uh, our first production was July of 1998, so it'll be 20 years in July. Uh, we've produced over 42 million tons of, of coal. Uh, our biggest year was 2005 where we produced uh, 4.6 million tons. Uh, you can see uh, that we have our, our uh, least coal acreage is over 9,500 acres. However, our disturbed acreage to support this operation is 105 acres. 
the central mine facilities that you see here uh, include uh, just 21 acres. So we are sensitive to the, the surface. Uh, we don't disturb property unless we absolutely have to. Um, the contemporaneous reclamation that we completed was at our waste rock site. Our waste rock site is located approximately six miles south of the mine. A uh, little bit of history on our waste rock site. It was originally permitted in 2002 to just support uh, construction rock that, that may be produced at the Dugout Canyon Mine. In 2006, Canyon Fuel Company uh, refurbished a preparation plant at the Savage Energy Terminal. So we actually started washing coal for dugout and producing a refuse stream. Uh, at that point in time, the waste rock site was expanded to accept this refuse. Um, beyond that, we, we actually expanded that operation at uh, the preparation plant to actually wash coal for our sister mines, Sufco and Skyline, and we now wash coal for third party operations as well. So the stream of refuse has been uh, ever increasing, um, requiring an expansion uh, of our waste rock disposal site. We were originally permitted for about a million tons. Uh, the figure on the left uh, was our first expansion, the, the little uh, extension to the northeast added another 62,000 tons. We called that our phase one expansion, but more recently went to a more aggressive phase two expansion that added uh, an extension to the pile to the south. Uh, you can see there's also a sediment pond that's uh, along the road on that southern edge as well. So we added uh, over 800,000 tons of capacity to this facility. This was permitted by Dogham. We received approval in June of last year and we initiated this expansion last year. It's a little bit more of a blow up of our expansion. This uh, phase two expansion, we, we chose to expand uh, to the south. Uh, it was a modest expansion that will add about 200,000 tons of capacity. So we stepped into this expansion. So we only disturbed acreage we thought we needed. We left uh, some of our permitted acreage uh, undisturbed and, and we can expand as, as uh, needs dictate in the future. This is some of the uh, operations of, of stripping that uh, southern expansion. We had to grub the material strip topsoil and subsoil. We were able to uh, uh, salvage approximately 462 acres of topsoil and over 10,000, or not acres, but cubic yards, I'm sorry. Cubic yards of topsoil and uh, over 10,000 yards of, of suitable subsoil. So you can see topsoil is, is very lean in, in the desert environment that we work in and it's very valuable for our, our reclamation as well. Uh, this is some of the progressions that, uh, that you can see in our pile. Uh, the left hand uh, illustration, 2013 before we made the phase one extension uh, to the northeast. Uh, center picture is a 2016 look at the pile with our phase one extension completed. And uh, the 2017 picture to the right is um, our phase two expansion underway. So you can see on the very southern edge of that, the sediment pond is, uh, is developed and we have positioned the topsoil and the subsoil that we recovered from the sediment pond construction up on top of the refuse pile. Uh, that was placed there for the contemporaneous reclamation that we implemented to the northeast corner. This highlights the area that we put into contemporaneous reclamation, our phase <laughs> one area. going to back up and show you the uh, uh, picture to the right, uh, the 2017 illustration of the pile. That was after we had implemented uh, a GPS guided uh, D6 caterpillar. Um, and if you can look at the outslopes, uh, they have all been shaped and smoothed to our ultimate design contour. So what we were able to do is utilize the GPS technology to actually maximize the amount of refuse. We put it into the design slope and those slopes were all smoothed and prepped and ready to receive soils for reclamation.
In order for us to get the GPS uh, guided cat to operate correctly, uh, there was a lot of work. Our environmental engineer spent countless hours. Uh, we used uh, Civil 3D with uh, AutoCAD to actually uh, modify and perfect the, uh, the ultimate slopes that we required for reclamation and for the maximum amount of material we could put on there. This was a trial and error type thing. Uh, we had countless hours, uh, loaded this up to the CAT, uh, took us a long time to validate that the GPS guided CAT actually was performing in a, in a fashion that, that we perceived it should. This is a little bit more of an illustration of uh, what the uh, Civil 3D program can do for us. Uh, the greens and the blue areas indicate the areas that can receive more refuse. Uh, pinks are up to grade, reds are a little bit too high and we can, we can shave some of that material out to get it to final, final topography. This is actually the uh, GPS guided cat that was uh, utilized for our reclamation. You can see the sensors up on the blade. Uh, this was a, a Trimble 3D uh, GPS guided uh, unit that was uh, installed on this particular cat. Uh, the, the woman sitting in the cab of the Caterpillar is actually Priscilla Burton. Uh, she is the uh, soil reclamation specialist for the division that works out of the uh, Price Office. Uh, Priscilla was a, was a great asset to us on, on this project. She helped us with the original design, uh, recovery of available soils, placement and, and validation for the project. So we appreciated her help on this as well. This is a brief video to really show the, uh, the entire progress of, of our reclamation. The erosion control matting was not required by our permit, but we found it very effective in establishing the needed vegetative cover. Some of you on the board may recognize this individual. I, I threw this in because uh, uh, I thought it was a good illustration of uh, basically when Chris Hansen speaks, everybody listens. But again, I, I do want to recognize uh, what Chris has done uh, for Kenyon Fuel Company. Um, under his leadership, we've really heightened the awareness of uh, environmental compliance. Uh, we've, we've built a, a compliance culture within the company, and, and this goes down through all the ranks. Uh, all of our employees understand the stewardship that's required on the properties that we have management over. So thanks again, Chris. <laughs> uh, in summary, uh, the contemporaneous reclamation that we did at Dugout, uh, the easy thing for us to do in our phase two expansion of our refuse pile was to strip the available soil, stockpile it, and worry about reclamation sometime in the future. What we chose to do is utilize this as an opportunity uh, to develop an effective means of reclamation, utilize the best available technology, implement it, and it now gives us an opportunity to monitor it so we can be more effective in the future and make adjustments as needed. That's my presentation, I appreciate it. Any questions? Thank you, questions? I have a question. Uh, could you tell the board what the content of the refuse pile actually is? What, what is it chemically composed of? 
it is uh, basically waste rock that comes from mining coal. So it's uh, shales and sandstones. Uh, anything that's uh, it's more dense than coal, it comes out from our preparation uh, uh, process. We have a heavy media uh, vessel that uh, the denser material will sink out. So we do get uh, uh, mostly shells and sandstones. We are obligated by permit to test it uh, routinely for toxic material. So far we've had no, no issues with that. So it's pretty benign material. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this next presentation is by Rio Tinto Kennecott and will be presented by Trevor Heaton and Zeb Kenyon. Um, their uh, project is for outstanding final reclamation for the ongoing East Waste Rock and South Waste Rock Reclamation Project at the Bingham Canyon Mine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board for the opportunity to present on Bingham Canyon Mine Reclamation. <clears throat> um, my name is Trevor Heaton. I'm a reclamation engineer out at Kennecott, Rio Tinto Kennecott, and with me is Zeb Kenyon, reclamation project manager. He's the project manager over much of the reclamation that we'll be talking about today. The Bingham Canyon Mine is a top producing copper mine. It's the second largest copper producer in the United States. It produces roughly 25% of US copper production, and it's been in operation for about 115 years. Legacy waste rock is the most visible impact of mining in the Salt Lake Valley. <clears throat> in the 1970s and 80s, uh, before Rio Tinto acquired Kennecott, mining operations created the tall waste rock features that can be seen throughout the valley. Because the waste rock features are so large, enormous amounts of material would have to be moved uh, in order to reclaim in a conventional top-down dozer push or using a load and haul method with excavators and haul trucks. Um, the size of the, of, of, of the project here, if, if you look from the south to the north, from one end of these waste rock features to the other, it covers approximately five to six miles. Um, <clears throat> it's just not practicable to reclaim from a top-down method with dozer push. And not only that, but it's also not required in our 1976 mining reclamation plan that governs our Bingham Canyon mine operations. These, these pictures give, uh, give some of the context in terms of the size of the waste rock uh, features that we're dealing with. Uh, the photo to the left is looking to the north. It's of our keystone uh, waste rock feature. It's looking to the north, northeast. The photo to the right is the same waste rock feature, but looking to the west. Um, <clears throat> these waste rock features, as, as you can see, they're like small mountains. Uh, you can you you can see how how large they are in context with the roads that are nearby and and, and the mountains that are across across the viewscape. Um, because they're made up of waste rock, they can't support vegetation without the appropriate growth media on top of them. Because their their size, their height is a continuous slope up to 1,200 feet. It, it's you can't place topsoil or growth media on top of these. If you place topsoil on top or growth media, it would just fall to the bottom. When the rock was 
removed from the mountain and placed in the waste rock features. Much of the rock, because of the, of the, of the geology of the rock, reacted chemi chemically with the outside air and water. And as it's exposed to the air and water, it produces acid rock drainage. The configuration of the waste rock features uh, makes this acid rock drainage worse. Um, as the waste rock features were constructed because of their size, um, they, were, they were constructed from a top-down angle of repose method. And as the waste rock was dumped on top using haul trucks, the, the larger rocks and boulders would roll to the bottom and the finer material would settle out at the top. Because the larger material uh, would roll to the bottom, it allowed for large void spaces and, and created uh, kind of an air chimney in the bottom that would allow air to, to, to ingress into the waste rock feature from the bottom. And as that air combines with the waste rock and from rainwater that falls on the waste rock feature, it creates additional acid rock drainage. Rio Tinto Kennecott, uh, at, at Rio Tinto Kennecott, we're committed to minimizing uh, the, the risks associated with our mining operations. And so we began looking for a solution to this, this challenge that we faced. We began looking roughly 10 years ago, trying to find ways to, to address this issue. And as we looked at, at various options, we developed an innovative solution that instead of trying to reclaim these these waste rock features from the top down, we would start from the bottom up. And if we could harness additional waste rock from the pit, we could place this waste rock in front of the waste rock dumps, in front of the waste rock features in a stair, te in a stair step approach that would allow us to then reclaim this additional waste rock. Uh, to, we, would, we would place it in a manner that would allow us to reclaim it as a feature. So essentially, here you can see on this figure to the left is the legacy repose waste rock slopes. We place material in the front in shorter lifts. Again, it's placed at angle of repose. And then once the material is placed, we, we would then go back in and regrade these waste rock slopes to a, to a slope, a reclaimable slope that would allow us to place topsoil and growth media on top. So I'm going to provide a, a reclamation overview. Uh, what you're looking at here is a cartoon figure of East Waste Rock. The, the bottom slide, you can see our, we have a complex network of cutoff walls and French drains that capture the subsurface waters that are impacted by waste rock, and then a, a network of piping to direct that water via gravity flow to our reservoirs for containment. Um, this work required um, work with both uh, DNR and DEQ and multiple divisions within those organizations for permitting. <clears throat> the other challenge was to maintain our existing system and permit requirements while we construct the new system. Mm -mm. Button am I pushing? So implementation really began in earnest back in 2006 with Bingham Canyon. That's on the bottom left of your screen. Um, covered about 150 acres. It was 800 feet tall. We were required to reclaim that area within two years of placement of that waste rock. Uh, we, we did achieve that successfully. To date, we've spent <clears throat> on these construction projects well over $100 million in regrading um, soil salvage and placement of cover material, seeding, vegetating. So I'll take you through the various steps of our process. This picture here is the East Waste Rock. Uh, we're salvaging soil to bedrock. It was about a 350-acre area. You can see the numerous um, work fronts we've got taking place here. Uh, there's a scraper in the bottom left corner of, or bottom right corner of that screen, and then three tr track hoe and um, haul truck operations in the center. Uh, the red circle indicates our soil stockpile where the material is hauled and placed uh, for future use, and the red aerials, arrow indicates that haul route up there. 
To date, we, this project, uh, we stockpiled 13 million cubic yards of material for future use. Uh, to di with the, the addition of Bingham Canyon and South Dump, we're closer to about 13 million uh, cubic yards of material salvaged and stockpiled for use, and some of it already in use for cover. <coughs> The next step is to uh, construct our our new cutoff walls. Now the cutoff walls are concrete structures keyed into bedrock in uh, major drainages to capture any of the subsurface water. Uh, with East Waste Rock, we also in constructed a above grading, upgrading of those walls, a uh, tow drain uh, with perforated pipe to capture any of that subsurface water. Everything in red here in that diagram indicates contact water, so lower pH waters. And then anything below the cutoff wall was double containment, so a pipe inside a pipe. The design also included segregation of surface water and subsurface water. So any storm water is captured in a detention basin and routed separately and into a canal. At some point, if we can demonstrate clean water at the end of reclamation, we should, our, our objective is to discharge that water and not commingle it with the process water. Um, surface water, <clears throat> we've been, uh, bottom, bottom left here, we, we see uh, East Waste Rock. We built, um, detention basins, uh, everything designed to a 100 year, 24 hour rain event, uh, minimize the risk of release. Uh, the, the structures are built <coughs> with the intention of around the, the weather conditions that we anticipate at the mine. So the amount of rain we'll, we'll anticipate with the, between the, the lower elevations and upper elevations of the waste truck dumps. <coughs> To date, we've created 110 acre feet of additional storage above and beyond what we had prior in 19 different drainages. Um, then comes the overburden placement. So as Trevor was showing in those um, diagrams earlier, you can see here in the bottom left screen looking north the light gray stair-stepped waste rock placed out in front of the more oxidized, tan-colored legacy waste rock in preparation for reclamation. The lifts are typically 200 feet tall. Um, it's a balance between the mine operations, um, providing enough capacity for, for what we want to do, and making it a, 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 a structure that we can get in and, and reclaim again efficiently. In this picture, you'll see uh, four D10 dozers. Uh, that's what the red arrows are indicating, pushing waste rock uh, from angle of repose to a two and a half to one slope. The red circle on the left is where the soil from that drainage was stockpiled. And this is in the south drainages. And the circle on the upper uh, center is the mine salvage material, so anything that's uh, of acceptable pH and um, other characteristics that we can use to, to cover the, the waste rock at reclamation. Uh, when we design these, we have, uh, we do aerial survey with drones to make sure uh, we're, we're hitting our design. Uh, it's important because we've already built the structures down at the bottom, and if we were to over dump, over push, then it would be expensive to haul that material back up the hill. So it's very, very well orchestrated. In comes the growth media placement. Typically, it's one meter thick. Uh, here you'll see various uh, steps where no cover cover being staged in the center and then cover being pushed down uh, on the right. Again, uh, we do use uh, aerial survey to, to do quality control to make sure we're hitting our cover thicknesses that we want to achieve. The material is then ripped on contour and that prevents wa surface water from running down the slope and then also provides a, a nice um, microclimate for the seed to take root and grow. These are some pictures from uh, last year, last spring, we seeded this area. Uh, this is in the south dumps. 
the east waste rock in the background on the right side and legacy dumps above. We wanted to point out that all this work doesn't take place in a, in a vacuum and just at our facility. We, there's a lot of research and development that goes into, into the efforts here. Uh, the bottom left is we're showing what we're trying to achieve, which is um, breaking up those chimneys by regrading the slope, uh, the stair steps, the uh, cover to minimize oxygen ingress and oxygen, and ultimately uh, limit the amount of ARD that we need to manage in perpetuity at the toe of the dump. The drill rig to the right uh, was a drill that was on top of our waste rock dumps. We have several of these holes. Some of them up to 800 uh, plus feet in depth where we have oxygen and um, moisture sensors to understand how our, how our dumps are behaving and how to, how to approach them at closure. In this slide, there's, also, there's some more research and development. On the upper right is a storm release cover plot. Now that's taking our, our, our site-specific uh, climatic conditions and uh, cover materials, instrumenting those to understand how they're performing, how much water is passing through, how much is holding. Also look at the vegetation and see how that's performing. The bottom, you can see a red circle, and that's more instrumentation on a cover that's installed. And those covers actually, we, we applied various ratios of mine salvage material and growth media. What we want to do is armor so we don't have erosion, but we also want those, that fine material so we can support vegetation best and, and pr keep it sustainable. We also look at varying cover thicknesses, anywhere from f typically three and a half feet to four and a half feet. So these trials are to, to verify what we, what we suspect. Um, we also looked at uh, various blends or, uh, of ratios of you know, how much coarse and how much fine to, to use in those areas. And uh, we also look at different seed mixes in those areas. We'd also like to point out that we work with some of the industry experts for research and design and also with implementation. We work with some, some of the best construction companies uh, available to implement this work and to make sure it's done safely and efficiently. Today we have about 550 acres since 2006 in Bingham Canyon. Approximately 110 acre feet of additional storage capacity designed to a 24 hour 100 year event which is above the requirements of a 25, 24 hour event. And we've also salvaged approximately 13 million cubic yards of material uh, for future use and reclamation. When this project is completed, upon completion, this project will eliminate uh, the, largest the, the largest single reclamation liability in the 0002 permit, which is the permit that governs the, the Bingham Canyon mine. And uh, Rio Tinto, we take our obligations seriously and we take our, our, our environmental obligations seriously. Uh, this project demonstrates that. And this, this project will, be, will provide a step change improvement in the Salt Lake City viewshed. It will create hundreds of acres of new wildlife habitat. And Rio Tinto, we're proud of identifying, designing, and implementing a world-class solution to a unique and difficult challenge. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, any questions? Board members, any questions? Mr. Hanson. It's an impressive uh, project, and I wanted to ask you a question about your low pH water that you recover from the French drain system. You say you direct it to some ponds. Are those treatment ponds, or are they total containment ponds? What's what do you see as the future of that water? Um, and as you know, as the mine ages and eventually goes to closure. 
Well, currently we'll recover the copper from that water coming out of the dumps. Uh, it does get commingled with our process water now. It goes to tailings. It's neutralized and, and, and settled out at tailings and then recycled at 40,000 gallons a minute back into the process at the mill. Um, future use of that at closure, I'd, I'd have to defer to the, to the closure study group on that, but. Yeah, we're, we're looking into that. We're, we're evaluating how this is gonna behave as we perform large scale reclamation projects such as what, what we're presenting today. Um, these reclamation projects decrease the amount of water that we have to manage in the future. And so we're evaluating how that'll behave in the long term. There will be treatment through um, probably the neutralization with lime material. Thank you. Thank you very much. This next presentation is from Canyon Fuel Company and it's the Skyline Mine and it will be presented by Greg Galecki and Craig Brown. And this project at Skyline Mine is for outstanding results following applications of innovative environmental technology. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be able to present to you uh, this morning. I want to go ahead and take the time to introduce the rest of our team that came with us. Uh, back there in the beautiful purple shirt is Taylon Earl, and sitting next to him is Hal Livingston. Uh, they do a lot of the work at Skyline as far as environmental compliance, um, so they're here to show their support for uh, Greg, who will do the bulk of the presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, so here's a, to start off, here's a, a picture of um, Electric Lake, you know, Skyline area where we're mining. Down in the very bottom right hand corner is the uh, stuff, is the Swens Canyon mine or ventilation shafts, which we're going to be talking about. I'm not sure how to. Um, Okay, so for orientation purposes, um, you see up in the upper left hand portion of the slide is where Dogham is and the Skyline Mine is southeast, approximately two hours or 90 miles. We're kind of in a unique area because we're uh, in the north end of the Wasatch Plateau and we, we covered areas in about three different uh, three different counties. You have Carbon County, Emory County, and San Pete County there. A uh, little bit more orientation. You see the town of Schofield, uh, our Skyline mine facilities in the center, and then a little bit towards the bottom left is the um, Swens Canyon ventilation shaft, which we'll be talking about. What you see in the gray is our, our mine workings. The, the green line represents the Flat Canyon uh, lease which we recently um, acquired and that'll be the future of the mine for the next approximately 12 years and what comes also comes into play is that the yellow line you see it's highway 31 which is a scenic byway but also part of the energy loop so being in the forest and where we're at we we take uh, stewardship and visibility you know pretty importantly at the mine So here's a, a view of the, uh, the, the Swens Canyon area. What we needed to do is for the Flat Canyon uh, expansion, we needed ventilation. And so we needed a, a, a shaft. What you see in the, the left portion a bit prior to construction, uh, I can't, I'm trying to find the mouse here. Well, in the left side of the, uh, of the slide, it's a little bit of a knoll. And that's where primarily where the uh, the shaft uh, construction area is, and this the basin here in the in the middle is an area that we had permitted for uh, for tailings or uh, cuttings from shaft development. 
the illustration you see here is the what we had permitted for the Swens Canyon shaft. It was permitted at seven, <clears throat> a little over seven acres because we didn't know uh, we were either going to do a, a blind bore technique or a raised bore technique. The blind bore is pretty much conventional, uh, it can, conventional drilling method where you would start the surface and, and drill down with the, uh, circulating the, the cuttings up to the surface and bringing them up and storing them. Uh, the area that you see outlined in red is the area that we would have needed for the, the blind bore technique of, of drilling. Uh, we decided to the mine decided to use the raised bore technique, which essentially leaves the cuttings in the ground. You start, rather than starting at the surface and uh, working your way down, you start at the bottom and you leave the cuttings at the, at the bottom of the hole. So from an environmental perspective, what we wind up doing is we reduce the area of the, uh, of the disturbance from seven acres to low, low over four acres, 4.2 acres, which is a 42% reduction in the si amount of area that needed to be disturbed. When you think the amount of uh, the work that goes into it, it was a, a thousand foot hole with a 16 foot diameter. So there's quite a bit of material that needs to be moved. So here is a, an illustration of some of the work that it had to be, be done for the, the, the raised bore technique. Uh, what you see in black is the development mining that needed to be done prior to the uh, shaft construction. You see the, in red where it points to the shaft location. Um, you know, part of the challenges there were, you know, with, with the blind bore, you can just make your hole and then you mine towards it. Here you had to have, you know, mining done in advance of it because you had to, before the project can start for the ventilation, you needed to have all the mining done underground and then you had to hit, hit that target. Um, in addition, we had to make enough room for the, the 13,000 cubic yard of cuttings to be stored underground. Um, so eventually what happened is that about 1,600 feet of uh, mains and cross cuts needed to be, uh, you know, filled filled with material, and that was in this area all through here. We still needed to, um, for for storage, there were still about 2,900 cubic yards that needed to be shipped out for, from the mine to to the surface because we just didn't have enough room underground. So. The difference between choosing a blind bore method and the uh, raised bore was additional cost. So we had about $350,000 of underground labor to for the additional storage, about $75,000 to repair and maintain the, the equipment. And then for that additional almost 3,000 yards that we had to remove from the mine is about $95,000. So I'll, I'll point out real quick uh, before we move on there is the mine is not staffed accordingly to be able to handle this size of a construction project. And so the additional labor was uh, contractors that we had to bring on specifically to support the raised bore method. So it was a cost above and beyond what we had planned. Um, and then the repairs and maintenance of underground equipment, there again, the mine isn't, we don't have an equipment fleet such that we were able to support this project with our own equipment. So we had to rent um, equipment to be able to handle the material. So th that's those costs. Oh, that came in. I was wondering where that heading went. Okay, so to give you a little bit more of a visual representation of, of, the, of the location, that's during construction. What you see in the center of the, the photo is uh, the pad where we're actually doing the, the, um, the pilot hole for, for the shaft. Um, up in, in just above the drill rig here, you know, we, we placed the topsoil in topsoil and subsoil into the, it, you know, we, we tried to work it into the natural contours of land. Again, I think you can see a little bit here. Uh, it's actually, it's illustrated more that there's a little bit flat area of the, um, 
a flat area on the hillside, which just enabled that we didn't have to do, cut as much material. Again, in, in the foreground is the um, Highway 264, which is an energy loop and, and the scenic byway. And so we wanted to be cognizant of that. Um, again, we reduced the disturbed area by about 42%. Oh, interesting, these are coming up. Okay, the, um, what you see in red in the hatch is that had we gone with the blind bore technique, that's the area that would have been disturbed and also the, affected visually um, it, had we brought the cuttings to the surface using the blind bore technique. Another uh, view of it from the surface while during construction is that the red line illustrates the areas of that, that little basin that would have been filled in all with, with, with material of cuttings. Um, it, and then in summary from what was a slide ago, that it, in addition to the uh, additional work, well, the work that underground and the timing of that added approximately uh, a little over a half a million dollars to the to the cost of the project to save that, not disturbing that area. So I think we'd be a little remiss if we didn't um, talk a little bit about the blind bore actual technique, drilling technique. Um, the illustration that you see is is the uh, is the rig itself. And what happens is you initially have to, what we did at the project, you initially draw, uh, drill a hole down or a pilot hole to the mine workings. That's what you see in that, that left diagram. But then prior to the actual drill, um, pulling of the shaft, we grout it all the way around the, uh, the pilot hole as well as where the shaft would be coming up. So it would minimize any groundwater if we encountered groundwater you know, during the construction of the shaft. And then, you know, there's a lot of uh, the PSI to, to pull the, um, you know, the drill bit up. It requires for the, um, for the drill rig itself to be on, you know, stabilization. So what happened in our uh, situation is we had about 70 feet of colluvium between, you know, the surface and where the bedrock was. So that all had to be mucked out and then backfilled completely with concrete so that the rig had a you know, firm foundation to sit on. And then from there, it would you know, start pulling the hole. Um, here's a little video, just briefly, of, of mucking the hole out. You can see the, see the pilot hole, and then you know, it's pretty laborious. They, um, you know, with air, they filled Oh, great. They fill buckets up and, well, it was about to dump into that bucket there and then they just haul it to the surface. It seems like it's uh, a little bit of ar arcane way of, you know, getting down to it. But again, you can see the safety things. They had to form it all the way down for safety. The, the reg tube is air going down. And then again, that, once we muck that all out, that all had to be filled with 70 feet of concrete you know, to the surface, and then they would mine that out. Um, another illustration of the rig. So it's pulling from 1,000 feet down and a 16-foot diameter drill bit that's being pulled to the surface. Um, you'd think that the rig is, is enormous. You know, from there you could see, you know, for scale, the, you know, the flag and the connexes and the size of the, you know, the rig itself. That rig pulls at, at 2 million PSI to pull that, you know, pull the drill bit up. So it's, a, it's pretty impressive. That's, this is an illustration of the, um, the drill bit underground before it started moving its way up. Uh, you know, augering a 16-foot uh, diameter hole, you'd imagine it, um, you know, it, it's a pretty big bit. And what happens there, it moves pretty slowly. So on, when things are going well, they would get about a foot and a half uh, an hour. And the size of that, uh, it, it, the bit turning, it, it, the, the RPMs is about two or three RPMs 
So it's, it's moving really slowly, and it's just with pressure grinding its way up to the surface. And that's that's a quick illustration of you see the, um, you know, the, the bits on it as it's it's coming to the surface, and it was you know working its way through the concrete. Um, you know, in in summary. Doing the raised bore technique, it had some challenges to make sure that we had everything in place that the project could be completed on time. Added another, a little over half a million dollars to the project, and that, but it reduced the, the, the surface disturbance by about 42%. What you see here is we're down the shaft, obviously, about 300 feet, so that's only about a third of the way down to where, you know, of completion. And what we're doing is we're, it's being framed, um, you know, with concrete, lined with concrete uh, all the way down. And, and I guess a, a big part of uh, environmental excellence is that, you know, we, we appreciate, you know, being acknowledged for the, um, for the types of things and stewardship that we, we do all the time at the mine and, you know, within Canyon Fuel. And so uh, we appreciate the acknowledgement and the opportunity to to show our, our project. Um, do you have any questions? Board members, questions? And co or comment? <laughs> I think this was the first time that Skyline ever had to move snow inside the coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing this during the winter time and I spent a lot of extra time moving uh, snow. Hmm. Anyone else? Oh, I do have a question. How are you going to reclaim this? Um, in, in what, I mean, we'll go back to AOC, you know, approximate original contours, and they'll allow the, the shaft itself, it's an engineered fill. So. You've had, had you formed this using conventional drilling method, you would have had the, the cuttings available to backfill this hole, right? Uh, that's true. That it would have been stored at the surface. So that's that's one thing. There will be additional costs because we'll have to bring, you know, have fill there to you know, reclaim the shaft. Thank you very much. Thanks. This next presentation is also by Canyon Fuel Company, but for their Sufco mine. Uh, the presentation will be by Vicki Miller, and the Sufco project, the Sufco mine project, highlights environmental improvements to an active mine site. Good morning, and thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a tour through the trails associated with. Sufco Mine. None of these trails are actually um, on property currently leased to us, but are immediately adjacent. Um, I want to tell you that every year it's a consistent occurrence that as Mother Nature moves from winter into spring, and any of you that drive a highway that might be bordered by rock or soil will notice that um, the earth decides they're gonna put a portion of that in your way. They're going to drop it onto whatever flat area there is. So the trails that are adjacent to the mine site are no different. Some of them are in areas that have extreme rock cliffs and drop boulders the size of Vol Volkswagens onto the trails, and some of it is just merely soil. So I'm going to show you the th three trails that Sufco has maintained for 40 plus years. Um, it 
SUFCO has been in business since 1941. I'm not sure if we went back that far, if these trails have been maintained that whole time, but we do know that we can record for the last 40 years that we have been maintaining these trails. The three trails are Broad Hollow, which is to the west of the mine site, which is actually a Forest Service trail. Um, the second trail is the East Spring Canyon Trail, which actually w winds from the bottom of Quichapa Canyon up past the back side of the mine site and then goes beyond up to the top of the, of the range there. The third is the Quichapa Creek Trail. Um, each trail is a certain distance, a certain length. Each trail has its own characteristics. So I'm going to, here's a map showing you the trail system. The, you can see where Sufco Mine sits at the bottom of the 3.8 mile trail. You can see the mine site dot there in red. You can see the Broad Hollow Trail. Um, it's 1.7 miles, the um, East Canyon, or East Spring Canyon Trail, 3.8 and the Quichapa Trails, 11.3 miles. They all connect. Um, they allow access from Highway 10. You can see SR 10 down there on the, I'm going to say on the left, depends upon what you're looking, how you're looking, but you can see the SR 10 sign there. The, you can access at that point with an ATV and you can travel the entire distance and use either of those trails, either the East Spring Canyon Trail or the Broad Hollow Trail to the top. Here's the Broad Hollow Trail. It was constructed in the 1800s. Its primary use at this time is ATV um, access, but in addition, this is the main trail that they take cows, cattle up from the bottom up to the top. The East Spring Canyon Trail, as you can see, is there by the mine site. You can see the mine site in the background. It is maintained. These trails are all just ATV, foot, or horse trails. This is moving quicker than I thought we may have to start over again. The Quichapa Creek Trail as you, is, is that entire canyon. I'm going to let you go through and just look at these, and then I'll start it over again, and then I'll talk a little more about them. The other th um, item I'm going to talk about is the Quichapa Reservoir, which we've been working on for years. So this is the Broad Hollow Trail. So that was the first one. And we have a corral at the bottom, a large corral that we constructed for the cattlemen. And there's also a corridor that takes you beneath. This is the East Spring Canyon Trail. And um, it, as I said, it goes up behind the mine. You can see here where the East Spring Canyon Trail and the Quichapa Canyon Trail or the connect there at the bottom. This gives you a slight overview of the um, Quichapa Trail. You can also see that there's petroglyphs. Um, this is when technology isn't helpful. <laughs> there's, a, there's a version on there. Okay, all right, I have help, thank you. Okay, this um, is the Quichapa Creek Trail. And as you can see, it goes far down the canyon and you can also see that it is a utility corridor. And so by maintaining the trail, we allow 
the utility companies to proceed um, and get their work done and maintain that. Also, you can see off to the left-hand side that there's a creek. Go ahead. And um, one of the features that is particularly interesting about the Quichapa Trail is the Quichapa Creek Trail is that there's a lot of very interesting formations. We also have petroglyphs along that trail and historic markings by cattlemen who've dri who have come, driven their cattle up these trail for years and they have left engravings on rocks and they've also engraved trees along this trail. So it's quite an interesting trail to go along. Okay, um, And the creek also runs along this trail. One thing that we have done to improve and to protect the creek is we have installed fences and berms along the creek, one, creek, one to keep the cows out of the creek and also um, in protection of the creek from the from the cattle as they come up that. Now the cattle come up every, they go up every spring, they come back down every fall, so it's used at least t twice a year. There's probably three, three to 400 head of cows that come up every year. We do get um, hikers on occasion. We do get ATV riders. Um, we also, have, we had one brave soul that tried a mountain bike up this trail. Um, it could be done by a mountain trike or a mountain bike. I just don't think it's been discovered yet. I just don't think anyone knows it's there. Thank you. Next. Okay, this is the Schoonapah Reservoir. What we've done with the Schoonapah Reservoir has been a process that's been going on for about the last 10 years. It's a small reservoir adjacent to the mine site that has had its issues. It was built in the 1800s. In fact, all of the um, trails that we that I've talked about were basically became active in the late 1800s. And um, this reservoir is right there with it. I was able to find a water right and um, permission to construct this reservoir. I think it was like 1836. I was really surprised to find it. Anyway, um, over time it's been a very remote reservoir. We have over time assisted in building a road to this reservoir. We have also the latest um, project that we have worked on and funded um, is we have put some trailer pads in there. There were supposed to be some tent sites constructed um, this past year, they didn't get done, but the trailer sites did get completed. Next picture, and you can see that they're they're being used. So, um, I just wanted to end with Sevier County. We've worked a lot with Sevier County on projects, and they have asked us. They come to the mine and and basically ask since we have equipment where. Um, where the mine is and these adjacent sites can be accessed by us and also the equipment's handy, I guess you would say. So Sevier County, the commissioners in particular have come to us for many years and ask us to assist with specific projects that seem to be important to the community. So um, in the letter, it says for many years, SUFCO has used its resources to make substantial improvements that benefit the public, wildlife, and ranching operations. Projects have included historic trails adjacent to the mine and improving the facilities at the Schoonapah Reservoir. SUFCO interaction with cattlemen of the area and keeping trails open and fences standing has enabled cattle to travel from the valley pastures to the mountain pastures above the mine on both the Fish Lake and Manti LaSalle National Forest. Historical and prehistoric sites along Quichapa Creek are accessible because the trail along the creek is maintained by SUFCO for ATV and foot travel. The cooperation and partnership that has been developed through the years between the mine and Sevier County are appreciated. Are there any questions? Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you.
the last presentation that we'll hear this morning is by Conoco Phillips and is pre presented by Sean Hammer. Um, and this project um, is nominated for environmental and wildlife habitat improvements to an active oil and gas drilling site. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the, the overview of this project um, is uh, Division of Wildlife Resources and ConocoPhillips uh, partnered in, uh, in many wildlife habitat improvement projects in and around the Drunkard's Wash field uh, for many years. Uh, this project was designed to improve the stream function as well as expand the riparian areas along the, the, the stream bed um, by installing uh, beaver dam analog structures within the Miller Creek. Um, and the benefit was to the upland game, uh, big game migratory birds and raptors. And just a, a little bit on the uh, beaver dam analog structures. Um, these were designed to mimic basically uh, a beaver dam in the fact that it slows the water in the stream bed and uh, allows the sediment to, to build up. Um, ConocoPhillips donated funding and provided volunteers to, in, to assist in the installation of the BDAS. The objectives were to um, help with some uh, flooding events that occurred following the Sealy Fire in 2012 that created uh, major damage to the creek um, and even subsequent uh, major storms for several years following uh, just er eroded the stream to the point where it no longer looked like a stream, more of a big uh, gash or chasm in, in the earth's surface there. Um, um, the installation of the uh, BDA uh, was to slow the water flow and create uh, sediment and, and allow the st stream channel to build back up. Um, this also allow, uh, allows the water surface to reach the floodplain, creating green vegetation and uh, during the hot and dry periods of the year. Healthy riparian areas provide forage, water, and cover for the wildlife and also create habitat for wildlife releases in the area. Um, there were nine beaver dam analog structures installed in August of 2017. Uh, ConocoPhillips Phil provided eight volunteers to work with the DWR uh, over a two-day period. And um, <clears throat> the visual sediment collection and, and water were reaching the floodplain. Uh, were, it was visible shortly after the installation. In fact, um, within hours, we could see that the water had slowed and there was some, some sediment building up. Um, some wild turkeys and California quail were released over the winter. Uh, the, the photos here show the the quail, and then there's a, a, a middle school student uh, that the DWR invited in to release uh, approximately 30 wild turkeys on uh, property in and around the Miller Creek area. The project location is about uh, 20 miles southwest of Price, Utah. The, the Miller Creek begins uh, near the top of Gentry Mountain and travels to the east across several private parcels, uh, ConocoPhillips parcel being one of those, and state land before ultimately joining the Price River. <clears throat> These are some photos of the project area following the Beaver Dam analog structure installation. I'd like to point out that the picture on the left is the photo of the result that, that we were trying to achieve here. And uh, by, by bringing that uh, stream bed to the surface. And you can see uh, on the upper portion of that photo where it's, it's still somewhat deep um, and behind the cedar posts there that are driven in the ground um, that the sediment has raised up. And, and that's exactly what we were trying to, to achieve there. Um, the other two photos show some completed Beaver Dam analog structures, photos that were taken that day, and uh, 
basically what, what we've done here is take some milled cedar posts and we drive those approximately four feet into the stream bank and the stream bed using uh, hydraulic handheld uh, post pounder. And then we've some cedar branches and sticks and other types of uh, nearby vegetation into those cedar posts to create that slowing effect such as you would get from from a beaver dam. The other two photos there you can see uh, are some areas where the, uh, the, the storms have basically destroyed the stream bed and with some hopes of repairing some of these other areas uh, in the future. Uh, ConocoPhillips has already donated materials for the next phase of the project. We're also working with other companies uh, to find other donated materials and uh, we will resume the second phase of this project um, in the fall of 2018. We continue to work collectively to improve different sections of Miller Creek and associated uplands. ConocoPhillips has donated um, funding to the DWR to continue restora restoration efforts along the Miller Creek in and around the Drunkard's Wash field. And as a quote from Nicole Nielsen, who is a DWR restoration biologist, uh, ConocoPhillips has become a valued partner for DWR, wildlife, and sportsmen of the local community, helping promote healthy habitats for wildlife through funding, donations, and volunteer efforts because, value, because wildlife is valuable to ConocoPhillips. Short and sweet. Any questions? Questions, board members? Yes, Susan. I can see that these are beaver dam structures. Are there no beavers in this area? There are not. <clears throat> Is that something you could import? Not sure. You'd have to defer that to a, a wildlife biologist. I'm not sure that that's uh, habitat for them. This is a question that uh, the beaver dam analog, are there beaver dam digital? <laughs> <laughs> Up and coming, I'm sure. What does the analog part of it mean? I'm not exactly sure. Um, again, this was a project that was uh, presented to us by the Division of Wildlife. Um, I thought that was odd as well, but uh, they seem to work, I can tell you that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that ends it, does it not? Well, um, speaking for myself, but I believe the whole board would concur, uh, these are the best um, presentation in terms of the quality of the presentations themselves, I think that we've ever had. Uh, we've had a lot of cryptic ones and short ones and two picture ones, but the, the, the depth and the discussion of your presentations were uh, excellent and we appreciate that. With that, we're going to take a, a 10 minute break and we'll come back and have our formal presentation. Again, thank you very much for your presentations today. Uh, oh, beg your pardon. We, that was as to the presentations. Uh, we still have a few minutes, and so the question, um, we have one last item, uh, public comment period. Thank you. Uh, is anyone here that would like to address the board on a matter within its jurisdiction? See some person coming up. If you would come up to the microphone and introduce yourself, give us your name and spell your last name and give us your address. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman Gill. I was here a month ago. You invited me back to give an update. My name is Morley Cox, C O X, one one nine nine Cliffside Drive, Logan, Utah, eight four three two one. President of the Bluebell Cat, uh, Angus Cattle Ranch in Bluebell, Utah, and uh, I'm a surface owner. My wife is a surface owner and a mineral rights holder. Uh, when I came last uh, month. Uh, 
the issue was uh, revolving around the, uh, the Axia well that was drilled in section 29 that we had received a, uh, our uh, division order in, uh, that we had to sign in February of this year, even though the well was completed in July of 2017. Uh, in working with family members, I noticed there's confusion as to what's going on. The family members don't seem to realize that we now have horizontal wells as well as, well as vertical wells. Uh, would like to recommend that you modify divisional orders. I look back in my wife's stack of stuff from years ago, and in the old days, the division orders actually showed how the mineral interest was calculated. Today, since we have two different ways with 640 and 1280, I'd like to recommend that uh, you have the operators, when they give us division orders to sign, that they actually put the number of acres and that, and the, the calculation itself there, because people are having trouble understanding and matching up with what they have previously understood, which was only 640. And I think that that would help. Uh, the second thing is, I'd, I'd like to compliment uh, your secretary, uh, Julie. I would have made very little progress without her initial help to understand what was going on. Uh, we, we have a little concern. All of the family members who are involved with uh, that particular well uh, drilled by Axia, uh, we all got that we've talked to, and that's six of us so far, we all got our division orders months after they should have been expected. Uh, Julie gave me the uh, Appendix A that was available on that well, 1 February 2017. All the family members are listed in that appendix, so they were all known about, but we didn't start to receive payment, of course, until after the division orders were signed. So the first payments are March of this year, and that seems to be a little late. Uh, my estimate is that we didn't start to receive payment until they'd actually sold enough oil and gas products off the well to pay for the cost of the well. So we don't, uh, we don't really understand why that happened, and, and we certainly, they didn't give us any interest on the money that might have been paid earlier. Uh, the other thing I'd like to uh, discuss is that the service that we got from Axia, uh, we didn't get any on that well. Uh, normally when EP Energy did it, we got not only service, but we got with it a list of everyone who was served. Uh, we got no service before that well was drilled that we know of, so the division order was a surprise, came very late would like to recommend that you encourage them to, to give the type of, uh, of uh, information to the, to the mineral owners that uh, was included in Appendix A, but not made available to the public or to the landowners or the mineral right owners. So uh, I progressed from what Julie gave me because I was trying to figure out for my wife what, what's going on, and one of the problems we're seeing is that a lot of the, she's involved with 18 sections. Uh, one of those is in the Crescent Point. Uh, two of them are outside both the Crescent Point and the Axia. There's 15 that are in the Axia. Many of those have never had a well even drilled on them before they started this horizontal stuff. And so over the last 40 to 60 years, uh, people haven't it apparently haven't managed their wills properly, and so there are a, there's a lot of issues with who really is entitled to oil. We're scratching our head trying to figure out what sections. Uh, I discovered a, a deed that my wife really didn't know was given to her 
landmen just show up and say, sign this, people were signing them, but we actually did have a 1976 deed that I dug out of the files, thanks to Julie and also the help of uh, the Encore people who work for Crescent Point. Uh, once I got help from Julie, I, I actually phoned Crescent Point Encore people, talked to Nicole uh, Mold, give her a pat on the back, she could answer over the phone a lot of the questions we had that came off the section 29. Discovered um, two pieces of, two, two sections my wife has royalty interest in and no leases, believe it or not. And uh, they turned that around in two days and we have leases so we're covered. But the real issue is that uh, my wife's uh, aunt, who is Goodrich, and, and I asked Nicole, I said, w you're struggling, and would you give me the list, just read to me the list of the Goodrich names that you know of that Crescent Point may be trying to locate who are deceased or their heirs should be entitled to the oil, and she'd start to read them off. Now, I'm not from out in that area. But it was a substantial list just of good rich names. So we know that they're out there searching, trying to put together who they really ought to be paying the royalties to. And I think if they published as early as possible, because I mean, we are talking about the, the Axia was 40 sections of land, and I think the Crescent Point is 20 sections of land. And Crescent Point didn't, when we got the notice for what's going to happen here in a few more minutes, uh, there was no published list of all of the owners that they knew about. That's a valuable resource for the families because if they have that list, they can see who they're still looking for, which is one of the things the people that they aren't able to locate are going to be force pooled. And quite frankly, we have family members who are concerned that since we didn't even get a division order until nine months, basically, after the well went into production, we'd like to know who we need to talk to to find out if any of the family members were force pooled. They're all in the, the Appendix A and identified, but... We don't understand why the division orders and the payments came so late and is and did that unintentionally penalize any of the mineral owners by getting them somehow force pooled even though the information was supposedly available before the well was even drilled. So is there a name of someone we can talk to about how do we figure out if anybody's been force pooled now that we are getting paid? I think what we'll do is we'll ask the division to look into that and uh, get you and us an answer to that. I would appreciate that uh, very okay. much. Okay. So, so I guess my, my recommendations are, I think you need to look at the division order. I think while people are getting their minds around, because we have, we have family members who didn't even know the horizontal wells were being drilled and that we're now at 1280s for those versus the old 640. When they look at the pieces of the paper, they're not sure what they're looking at. Uh, for people who are trying to put their family wills and everything into perspective, it would be really nice if they would publish the list. And I appreciate that when you're dealing with 40 sections of land, you may end up with 600 pages of names. But it would also be nice, and I think that the land people have the information, to put with each name when we have these huge packages of sections, which sections they even have land in that the land people have found so that we can help balance our own records against it and even help the land people find family members they may be looking for. And I've, I've already talked to, uh, to uh, uh, Marilyn uh, Young, Goodrich Young, and she's the youngest uh, child in that family. She's still living and so is a sister. Uh, and, and they can help identify some of these old time family lines that are remiss in, because 
wells weren't being drilled, people didn't even pay attention to the fact that there was any value there. And so there are estates uh, that uh, need to be repaired and the best information that we can have is what the land people have discovered in the records. I mean, I've been out there four times, spent over 16 hours. I still have four sections of land that I need to go through for my wife in order to try and figure out where she really is in this whole process. I think we got your point. I'm gonna to go to John Rogers. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cox has been into the division several times and as of last meeting, we gave him a name of Axia who to contact and did you meet with, uh, with Axia and talk with him? No, I opted to go to Crescent Point because they were the ones that we held the lease with. Uh, my wife held the lease with on section 29 and Michelle was a dream. She, she had records, but, but that record isn't being published for the general public. So that's my concern is uh, that we ought to be informing the people because the world is really changing and the value of the mineral rights is astronomical compared to what it used to be out there when they start drilling these wells. Uh, the, the section 29 well and two others that have been drilled by Axia are producing as much oil as the Sealy well on the land where we run our cattle ranch produced in five years. They're getting the same amount of oil almost uh, and in some cases better in one year out of these horizontal wells. And when you start thinking Crescent Point wants to drill 12 in a double section. Axia wants to drill 32 with provision to drill the ones on the edges at a later time. We're talking about astronomical change in value and, and the whole community needs to make sure that the people get compensated properly for their mineral rights and we got a lot of work to do out there. I understand that. Okay, well, Mr. Rogers. Well, as you understand, Mr. Cox, it's kind of a convoluted story that quite honestly, we don't even understand, but we have put him in contact with Axia. He's failed to talk with them. I didn't realize Crescent Point, we can get him some contacts at Crescent Point, but I think it's beyond a division matter and a board matter. It's something he needs to take up with those entities that he's working with. And that's where we'd leave Thank that. you. We I have run out of time, Mr. Cox. We appreciate your comments and uh, saw you at the Duchesne conference and uh, uh, we'll continue to look into this. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else like to address the board? Again, thank you for all those that have commented and presented today, we appreciate that. We're going to take a 10 minute break and come back for our formal hearings. <laughs>